Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Business of Business podcast. This is your host, Roy. Now, of course, we are the uh, podcast that we bring you a wide variety of guests that can talk about a, a lot of diverse topics, sometimes because we don't know what we don't know, and the other is sometimes that we do know where we're lacking, we're just looking for some help. So we try to bring you a lot of professionals and experts, and um, we're fortunate enough today to have another expert with us, Kristen McAllister. She is the co-owner of Sirius Executives. Uh, she has spent most of her career helping companies establish and improve their infrastructure for high growth. She has grown companies and created optimal infrastructure from both an operational and client management perspective. Kristen has spent the last 10 years teaching companies how to leverage executives for transition situations such as high growth and turnarounds. She is a national speaker and is published on topics ranging from operations and productivity to talent management and the contingent workforce. Kristen is a mother, an Iron Man, and a Marine wife. So Kristen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. So excited. Yeah. And uh, just going to mention you are the co-author of two books, The New Executive Search, How Smart Companies Are Using Interim Executives, and also How I Fired My Boss and Made More Money. So, you know, and uh, I guess that was one reason that I was interested in, uh, in getting you on here. I, first off, before we jump into it, I'm, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a couple of weeks now. So, but kind of tell us, how did you find yourself here? I mean, it, uh, you worked for some companies and just figured out where, the, where that, those pain points were and you've just been able to help others? A lot of it was just happenstance and accident. Uh, now, back in 2008, found myself the same as so many individuals as laid off from a company I'd worked for for 15 years and wasn't sure what to do. So I started consulting and thought I would help companies in that way. And the biggest problem with that was they didn't need to be told what to do. They needed help doing it. Exactly. exactly. That's where I came across the interim executive model where you step in for a period of time and help them actually get it done. Yeah, I can't tell you how many uh, people that, you know, how many customers I've worked for in the past that, you know, they just wanted the, the analysis and the report, they'll implement it. And then a year or two, three later, when you end up going back to work for them again, you find that report uh, kept gathering dust on a bookshelf somewhere that nobody's opened it up or looked at it. So you're right, you know, we could have the best plan ever laid out, but if we don't execute it, then it's worthless or just like having no plan at all. Yep, and that's exactly, I had a client, we laid everything out, we came up with all these solutions, and every month I get a call from the CEO saying, we've got a problem, can you help? And I say, we already solved that problem, go open up the materials. Right, right. And do that. But there was no one there to help affect the change and help guide everyone to doing things the new way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know that I was uh, kind of jumped off to a fast start. I guess what I was going to say earlier is that a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, they have the um, they have the belief that the only way that you fail is by not having enough customers. But you know, as we've talked, and what I would like to talk about more tonight is that um, sometimes we can actually fail because we are very successful, but we don't have that infrastructure to actually handle the customers. And then, if you're local, especially. You get a bad name and, uh, you know, I'll just use an example. There was a fairly new uh, pizza joint that just opened up not too far. And I was reading on next door about all the poor reviews. I mean, they had one or two bad nights and they got slammed. And it's because uh, they were just so busy they couldn't handle it. But, you know, as a customer, I don't really want to hear that. Not only not only for my pizza, but if you're building me a, you know, a piece of machinery or if you're doing work for me, uh, your, your poor planning shouldn't become my, my emergency. Yep. And those reviews are critical. We're finding, uh, you look at the infrastructure, it's now not just your customers, it's the talent you want to attract. One of the first things they're doing is uh, going to Glassdoor yeah. and looking at what other employees are saying about the company. Yeah, yeah good point. Uh, an employee, you know, I deal a lot with employee turnover, and that's one of the, the biggest things that I always talk about is let's be an employer of choice, not an employer of last resort, because 
people read all these troubles and when you have high turnover, the first thing they think is, wow, I don't, I don't need to get caught up in all of those problems. Yeah, it's interesting, especially what we've seen um, over the past year or so. And at any times, we always say don't hire or don't expand or don't invest until you absolutely have to, especially if you're a small growing company, you don't want to see that cash go out the door until you absolutely have to. And more so nowadays, we're seeing that as that'll kill a company. Because if they wait until then, it's too late and they're on the verge of imploding. Yeah, and, and I'll get you to talk just a little bit about that, the lead up to that. <clears throat> you know, some things off the top of my head are, well, we have to hire talent. We have to acclimate them because just because you're a great representative in sales or uh, customer service for another company, you need to learn my ways and that takes some time. So just talk a little bit about, you know, what are all those things that make that lag time for us? I, first of all, it's finding the right people that you need to bring in. So especially you've got people, you've got technology and you've got your systems and tools and all of those need to work in unison. So you can go hire next month, three, four, 10 additional individuals to help you. But if they're coming in, they don't have the technology and the, the systems to do it. They're going to come in and do it five different ways. Right, right. They're going to be rowing the boat in all different directions. And now those five are really only producing really effectively two, what two people yeah. would be producing. Yeah. And I've heard that in, and I've heard that before is, uh, you know, small companies started in a very small space. All of a sudden they find themselves needing help and they didn't even have a place to put those five people. They couldn't even get them in their current offices to, to set them down, to get them a phone line, to get them a computer. You know, and then you talk about having to expand space and moving or either having your space and then a space with other workers, you know, working remotely. It's uh, it, it can lead to a disaster in a hurry. Yep. And one of the smallest, easiest steps, especially nowadays with all the technology that's there, is documenting how things should be done. Otherwise, as you add people, it's going to be done all different ways and everyone's going to figure out or if you lose someone, and that's what you really see in a lot of small businesses is if they lose that one person with the brain trust, they lose how everything is done. Right. And so we're starting to get away from that. Tell someone to sit down and type up a 10 page SOP. Right. It's just never going to get done. It won't be kept updated versus if you tell someone to video how they do something or do a screen share, that's much easier training to keep up. Or when you bring on the next person, especially if you're training them virtually, record that and record every single training session that you do and you'll build up that library quickly. No, you make a good point about that is uh, the other thing is not only knowing what this person is or what you're supposed to do if you're in the seat, new seat, but um, also as you go through time, you may not do everything that you have to do the very first day. And so two weeks from now, you're trying to remember, you know, what did that guy tell me how to handle this situation? And then uh, either you have to go get up and find somebody where if you have it written down. And, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, like a, a flow chart that coincides with some kind of a, a standard work or some other kind of a, a more detailed in steps where it's like if the flow chart doesn't give me enough information or it can lead me back to the place where I need to go in order to find out exactly what, the, what I should be doing. Yep. And that's that we call it one source of truth. Yep. You go to one place that is the starting point and all the information you have is linked to that one place. So you don't have to remember 10 different locations to go to as oh, you're nice. training. And we also, we tend to want to brain dump and train everything and give new individuals everything from day one. Uh, one of the biggest uh, hiring trends we're seeing right now is new salespeople. And on day one through day 30, do they need to know the sales process once they're onboarding a new client or do they need to understand the value proposition and how to go get clients? Yeah. Train yeah, well, and teach you. Exactly. You know, and the other thing that we just kind of talk about onboarding for just a minute, I just happened to finish writing a piece the other day about onboarding and I found that, you know, that's a lost art. It's like because we 
we needed to hire this guy a month ago. And so we don't have time to go through this uh, onboarding. And, you know, one thing I, I try to recommend is we don't have to tell them every piece of information, you know, that the first morning on the job. I mean, let's, let's acclimate, let's give them enough to get them started, but you can onboard over the next two or three weeks some things that need to be done immediately, that's for sure. But some of this, it's like, and it's, you have to also put yourself in the candidate's position. Uh, you know all the stuff about your company. So it's like top of mind, but here's this guy, brand new, sitting you know, in a new office, new job, new everything. And then we just have this huge information dump on them. And when you look at onboarding, let's take the legal outside of it. Day one, if they walk away with nothing other than what is our company culture? Because yes. that's going to guide every other thing that they get trained on and all their interactions. That's right. a successful first day. Right. Exactly. So um, I don't want to skip over any good information, any pertinent information if you have it. But, you know, one thing we think about here in that high period of growth uh, and your, um, you know, your one of your books is talk, talks about using interim executives. And so you know, there are ways that we can use these fractional executives to help us through those rough periods till we get people in place, the right person. Because that's the other thing I think too, is we get in a rush, hire the wrong person. And so now we have just really messed ourselves up because they got somebody in a job that either can't do it, won't do it, whatever their problem is. Now we've got to stop, rehire, restart, and then to me, it makes it, it always just looks very sketchy to me as a customer when I go to the same business and it's just different person, different person, you know, every time. So let's talk about how the, you know, how can we use interim executives to kind of help us over the hump? In a number of ways. So think of expertise and executive talent and leadership, leadership as a whole. It's now a puzzle piece. It's you don't get have to necessarily look at the entire picture and say, I'm going to go and purchase this individual for $250,000. I can't afford that and say, I want this expertise here for the next three months, but I just need it one to two days a week. Or as you mentioned, to get over this hiring hump, we need to hire 10 people. Why don't I bring in an HR expert who's done that kind of ramp up and onboarding and put everything in place and bring them in for the next three months? It's no longer a one size fits all. So in any way that you need at each step, and one of the biggest things, whether you're even at $2 million um, at that size of a company, if the CEO is wearing the CFO hat and still doing all the accounting, the bookkeeping, the financials, um, it's not their highest and best use of time. And they're really supporting their growth yeah. by doing that. So it's a great way to step up the talent and the leadership whether it's to bridge a gap or to take that off of you as the owner. Yeah, and um, you know, a lot of times we talk about, this kind of gets back to knowing yourself and your skills that if you started this company and you're an awesome salesperson, then uh, why do we want to take that talent away from the front line and have you making entries into uh, you know, a ledger or journal or typing them in the computer, however. We need you, you know, you should be on the front helping train and, and teach our salespeople not doing the accounting. Absolutely right. And I am, I will say as a business owner, I am an absolute victim of doing that myself to where I love working with our clients. That's where I started, where I bought the right. business. I enjoy solving their problems. I enjoy being here and doing things like this yeah. with you and, and, and evangelizing what we do. But if I'm being the CFO or if I'm being the COO and I'm doing that, it's not serving the company and it's not serving our team the best. So being able to pull that off and bring uh, part-time individuals in to do that for me. I, I've never heard a CEO say, I, you know, I, I, every time they do that, it's, I waited too long. I, I've never heard anyone say, gosh, I should have waited another six months before I got in that help. It's always, I should have done it six months ago. <laughs> Yeah, and it, um, I'm gonna use a three-letter word here that gets in our way too. Is sometimes it's our egos that 
we, you know, this is our baby. We don't really want anybody touching it or we know what's best or there's a million reasons that we can use, but we have got to put that aside and say, you know, for the better of this business, we need some help in, you know, specific areas. Not that we couldn't figure it out even, it's just, is it worth the time and effort it takes to try to figure this out when we could get in, you could carry on with your job and let somebody else come in and take over that. I, you're absolutely right. And we really see it's the flip side. It's the ego. It's also the flip side of, I don't want anyone to know or realize yeah. how much I was trying to figure out that I was struggling. It's yeah. that insecurity of, I don't want anyone to know that I need the help. And I will say that right now is such a great pivotal time where we're seeing leadership and companies reach out more than ever saying, I don't have all the answers and I don't have to have all the answers. I, yeah. Yeah. And you know, that's one reason why I started this show two uh, years ago is because, you know, talk about another third component of that is sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And, you know, exactly. why, why I love this show is because I will guarantee you, I have never had a guest come on that I didn't learn something for myself. Sometimes it's simple things that you may have thought that you may have known or even practiced in the past that you got away from it. And, uh, you know, you're having a conversation like this and the light bulb goes off that, oh, wow, I really need to pay more attention to that. So, uh, you know, that also just the education of what, what are we doing or what could we do different? What could we do better? I, exactly. And it's the, uh, the listening to things like this and the realization and being able to not everyone can go and talk to five other individuals in their situation as, as business owners. Um, but being able to listen and hear and say, gosh, I thought I was the only one that had that right. issue. Exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. So let's take a step back. You know, we've talked about a lot of good things, but um, kind of want to go back to the beginning and we'll say that if you're a one man show and if you're a five man person, five company, five person business, um, you really need to give some thought on the front end to your strategy, overall strategy. You know, we need to look, what are you going to do for Mark? You shouldn't wake up tomorrow and say, I'm marketing today. You know, where do I want to start? What do I want to do? So, you know, we need to have this plan or this roadmap, but we also need to uh, maybe extrapolate that and do a pro forma for like two or three, five years, because what are the triggers in that? You know, we can talk a little bit. I'll let you uh, jump in there. But, you know, it's like we need to know, OK, what is going to be our trigger that we need to hire that next salesperson or what, you know, we need to buy a piece of equipment? What triggers that? So it's already thought out. It's not in the heat of the moment or it's not, uh, you know, we're so busy now that we can't get that in. I, that's always a tough one because you just don't know, you don't know, and you can plan, you can plan for two years down the road and that plan changed two months into it. Right. I think the, when you look at, I'm glad that you mentioned marketing, so we, sketching out a business plan and what does it look like? And at least starting with some kind of a compass, even if it changes in two months, mm -hmm. we've worked with a lot of startups. I've seen a lot of business plans and performance, and I will say the number one area that is without doubt underestimated is marketing and you hit the nail on the head Roy um, whatever that budget is double triple quadruple it especially your one to five person company and you want to grow never underestimate the value of marketing yeah and and I even go so far as to you know it needs to be stepped out like what are we going to do every day and you know you're right some days change and we don't get it done but um, you know I always like to have that plan so when I wake up in the morning it's not a surprise or I don't spend half the day thinking about what do we need to do. It's like we've got that plan already set out. It's just wake up and take a step, you know, step through that. Yep. And, and we can talk a little bit about uh, solopreneurs there in that because um, they typically get into a boom and bust cycle. It's like I've got no business today. Market, 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 market. And then you get a couple of jobs and it's fulfill, fulfill, fulfill. And then, you know, three, six months later, it's like, where'd all of our business go? Market, market, market. So you get this whole thing. And, you know, we could talk a little bit about, but, you know, like automation and things that we can do 
to keep that pipeline full. And, you know, we may have to take our attention off of it a little more, but again, we can hire interims, we can outsource some of it, we can get temporary help. There's a lot of things that we can do to help ourselves uh, even that cycle out. Yeah, I, from a solopreneur standpoint, I know a lot of independent uh, individuals out there, whether they're executives, um, they're starting a pool service business, whatever it is, um, not being the one to do it all is one of the best ways to avoid that boom or bust. And one of the hacks that we say is Upwork, upwork.com. It's a great place to find talent, project-based, um, reasonable rates for marketing, for lead gen, for just about anything that you might need, setting up your website um, that's cost-effective for you to be able to not be the one who's doing it all. Yeah. Yeah, and it takes a little bit of, of work, but um, it is a great tool. I've used it myself. I've used it from writing to editing to some graphic art, even um, used it for a ton of stuff. But it's wor well worth going through because the, the nice thing is, um, you know, especially the, some people I had writing for me or editing, uh, once you build a re relationship and have a little bit of rapport, they were. Um, a de facto employee because I could call them up and say, hey, I've got some stuff and they would put other things aside because they knew, number one, I, I had work, more work coming and number two, they knew I paid my bills. And that's, a, mm -hmm. you know, you got to take that into account when you have, uh, you know, when you're freelancing like that is, you know, did the work, am I really going to get paid? So they appreciate that when you can pay on time and, you um, like I said, they will, a lot of times they'll put you for, at the head of the line when you call back for another job. And never underestimate um, interns and not necessarily even college interns, but high school interns. How many individuals do you yeah. know either near you or far away with the virtual nature of things where they can do some of that. They can do build your website. They can do marketing campaigns yeah. for you or it'll take them a couple hours to figure it out and then they're wrong, running with it. <laughs> For some of us, they'll probably get it figured out a lot quicker <laughs> right, right, right. than we would. And it gives them an opportunity to learn and grow. Exactly, yeah. And again, I've uh, implored that as well and has some really good young people that come through that, uh, you know, I'm, again, I learned something from them. They were innovative. Maybe they learned something in school that they were able to teach me. But, uh, you know, sometimes just being around fresh ideas is kind of nice for the business owner as well. And I, more and more th where we're seeing, uh, you know, we talked about that ego or that, that you know, self-esteem, not wanting people to know that you don't have all the answers that seems to be diminishing more and more as we're seeing uh, businesses bring in advisors. I work in, we're working with a client, 1.5 million in revenue and works with an advisor a couple hours a month and is just helping him actually did some of the research on Upwork and I think they got a new logo for $50. And they love it. And uh, quite a few different things to be able to, those, those business growth hacks Right, to right. do all those, to make quicker decisions and think outside the box because we're so mired inside of our business on a day-to-day -day basis. And just having that advisor there to hold you accountable to move the needle uh, can be a tremendous benefit. Yeah, and it's, you know, it gets back to surrounding ourselves with people who we trust and who have our best interest at heart and also who are successful because of, you know, off topic a little bit, but you know, if we surround ourselves with people that just suck the life out of us, then that's kind of where we're going to end up. Where if we if we can find these other people that really want to help us that are upbeat and positive, it can make a huge influence on the way that we carry out our days as well. Why do you think people tune into your podcast, Roy? <laughs> encourage them and uplift them. Yeah, right. Well, thank you. I would I would hope that we can for sure. Another um, a great tactic that I've heard uh, more about is, and we used to have a round table of industry people. Now we, we were a little different. We were all in different disciplines, but we would meet about once a month and, uh, you know, just talk about what did we see in our business uh, 
it was complimentary. So if you had a, a customer that you couldn't fulfill their needs, then, you know, we could work together. So uh, there's that, but there's also even round tables of like business people that they just meet and they say, you know what, I've got, I've got this employee that's doing this. I've never seen it before. Don't know how to break it. What's the best? And this other guy that's sitting two chairs from you, like, you know what? I had that happen last year and this is how we worked it out. So you can get a lot of, you know, free advice at that way as well. You have to be willing to open up about it. But if you find people that you trust, that trust you and it's a tight group, it, it works very well. Whether it's from your industry, similar industry, we're, we're all members of associations and similar industry, but non-competing. Um, you'd be surprised at picking up the phone and saying, hey, you want to get together for an hour and talk. Everyone can sign an NDA. You'd be right. surprised at how quickly people then want to join. Right, right. Well, that's great. Do you have any other uh, any other tips for you know high growth? Either and well, one thing we really haven't touched about is that client, um, you know, the client management perspective. So let's talk about that for just a minute, if we could. What are some hacks or tips or tricks for uh, you know putting in a you know? Because the other thing is that that's to me it's an integral piece that's tough because. I know how I talk to my clients and I know how I want them treated. Now finding somebody that can mirror that or that we can train, it may take a little bit. So what are some things that we can do in the interim there? I would bring it back to culture, culture and your value system. Right? One of the first values that we have at Sirius that we teach is we teach, we treat our clients' business as though we're our own. And so every we don't have to train on how do you make decisions that guides the decision making. You make the decision that's in the best interest of the client. Um, and that will feed in throughout the organization. And, and as you and I both know, that's probably one of the biggest areas to focus on because it is so much better to do business with clients you've already done business with versus, and we're seeing um, at the management level and the executive level, one of the biggest growth areas is they're calling it client success and their clients um, director of client success or client success managers and what they're doing is they're the steward for clients from the first moment we start meeting with them or to, i'm sorry uh, reaching out to them via marketing to when they're working with us and they finish up and then keeping in touch with them ongoing because the biggest opportunity for growth and easy profitable growth is working with clients that you already do business with. Yeah, the acquisition uh, cost of clients, depending on your business, it, it can be astronomical where that repeat business costs you virtually nothing. We do need to follow up, you know, be mindful with them for sure. But that's uh, uh, a place that I see people give away a lot of money is that if, if they're like a one-off purchase is the client bought and they're gone out of sight, out of mind, instead of following up, staying in touch, giving them a phone call and seeing, you know, what else you can do for them. And then kind of building on that. The, the other thing is ask for referrals. You do not ask. And if you're providing a good product, good service, mm -hmm. good cost at good customer service, why wouldn't somebody want to refer you to their friends? And it's Sometimes it's just the way that we ask and it's not, do you know anyone else who could use my service or can you refer me to someone? It's, I'm glad I was able to help you. Do you know anyone else that I can help? And it's a bit more of a soft approach to it. And a lot of people just don't like to ask for business. And it's, uh, people want to brag too. I mean, just like me, uh, we have a, it was an old uh, mom and pop restaurant that had closed down. And uh, actually my mother called me, I think she called me Friday and, or Saturday, yeah, she called me Friday night and said, hey, did you see that place open back up new management? And I said, no, so we, we got some breakfast takeout Saturday. It was awesome. And so I just posted it on uh, next door because you know, I want them to succeed. They're very nice people with very good food. And I said, you know, y'all need to give them a try. Well, so today a guy posts back and said, I had a client lunch with 56 orders that I went up there for because he saw this, you know, he saw that they were open 
he's like, these guys need to advertise. He said they handled it, food was good, everything was smooth. So, you know, that's just a little bit of a domino effect about what happens if we can start getting the, getting the word out. And everybody wants to brag about who they know. So, you know, if you provide a good service, of course, people are going to want to refer you because they're going to want to brag about what a, you know, what a find that they had. And that's going back to the uh, roundtables that you mentioned of uh, just asking who did you use for Mark? Who did you use for that? This, this, and that. And we all want to feel good that we found a great person and they're so great that other people want to use them. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, Kristen, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day. Uh, I've got a couple of things before we, you know, wrap up, but one is what is a tool that you use tool or habit that you feel like really adds value to your life, either professional or personal. I, for me, it's a mantra. And I think that it's so valuable because it took me so long to learn. It was probably one of the hardest things to learn. So I'm that person who's guilty of, I can do it. I can do it all. And I can probably do it quicker than anyone else. And it's that mantra of highest and best use of time. What is my highest and best use of time, whether it's in business or even personally, I was complaining to my husband and I, I don't get to spend as much time with my son. And he said, well, then why are you cleaning the house? Hire a housekeeper. Why exactly. not the highest and best use of your time? And we said, go through a list of everything you're doing and look at what's everything that I can and maybe someone else should be doing it. And what's the cost you know, put a line item there. What am I paying myself versus what would I pay someone else to do that? And you'd be amazed at how quickly that cost structure comes down. Yeah. And, you know, that's one thing, uh, you know, that I've done in the past is, you know, when you hire people to do things, do chores for you, I guess, as you look at, well, mm -hmm. if um, I can spend an hour doing whatever this task is, that I can pay $20 in order to get it done. And in that same hour, I can do some marketing or do some other client work that makes me, you know, somewhere way above the $20 an hour figure. So it, it's really, if you sit down and put a pencil to paper, it's really a no brainer. I, it, the mental block that we all run into is doing something new for the first time. It's going out and finding that housekeeper. It's yes. finding someone who can run a marketing right. campaign. Yeah. Look through the long term. One year from now, where do you want to be? And continuing on this path is not going to get you there. Sometimes you've got to extend that little extra effort. Or as you mentioned, I love the referral. Go out to Facebook, LinkedIn, any number and ask, who do you know? Who would you recommend? Yeah, I think we have to think about a little bit of pain in the short run is going to uh, bring us, I guess, just relieve a lot of pressure on us as we go through the long term. And you know, we may have some false starts hiring people. I've done it before, even as much work as I put into it. Sometimes you just, it's not a good fit for whatever reason, but if you keep trying long enough, you, you will find the right fit for sure. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit. I know that you have a CEO quiz that um, basically is, is your company set up for success. And what that does it helps CEOs identify what areas that might be stalling them. Yeah, it is. Um, and my apologies, I actually am going to need to give you the website link to put in the notes of the, the podcast. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those, as we're growing our business, we don't always know what do we need to work on? Is it the planning part of it? Is it the execution? Is it the strategy? And we're always trying to work on all three of them at one time. So going through and just answering a few questions, this will help you pinpoint where you're getting stalled or where you need to start because you really just want to work on one at a time and where in that process is uh, holding up that growth and holding up that key to success. Okay. Yeah, awesome. We'll, we will put that link in the show notes so people can go over there and it'll be a, uh, you know, it'll be a good start. And uh, that way we can put you in touch with Kristen to uh, maybe help you out. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Ron. Yeah. yeah, you bet. So tell us who is your client? What can you do for them? And of course, how they can reach out and get a hold of you. Absolutely. Uh, our client is any small to mid-sized uh, business owner, CEO. We do a lot with privately held businesses and especially family owned businesses uh, on uh, providing. Think of it as we help you date leadership. 
So rather than hiring someone on a full-time longer term basis, you just need them in the short term or maybe just part-time. We help that matchmaking process. We ease it through it. And then we stay on and make sure that everything is accomplished. Um, we can be reached at seriousexecutives.com. That's C-E-R-I-U-S executives.com. All right. Well, awesome. Well, y'all reach out, hook Kristen to work for you, let her help you if you're going through some growing pains or even uh, it's even better if you just don't wait till there's pain. <laughs> if you go ahead and just get out front of this, let's put a strategy together uh, that, you know, can help you before you actually get into some trouble. So, all right. It. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of the Business of Business podcast. Uh, we appreciate all of our listeners very much. Of course, you can find us on all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, Spotify. We're on the, at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com, plus all the social media channels. So uh, until next time, take care of yourself and take care of your business.